Right, recall that an mRNA strand is created during transcription. It'll undergo modifications before it's then translated. Okay, this is known as splicing. So that pre-mRNA will have introns spliced out of it that are not coding for any amino acids in the polypeptide string being created. It's also actually possible to splice out exons as well. And this leads to a variety of combinations of exons in the resulting mature mRNA. And what this means is that some genes are actually capable of producing multiple varieties of proteins depending on what combination of exons are included. Included. Now once a gene has been transcribed it's ready for translation and it's possible to regulate the production of the polypeptide before it's even produced. If the mRNA is prevented from being able to enter the ribosome because of a protein that is binding to that mRNA then translation will be blocked. Now these proteins combine to many mRNA strands simultaneously which prevents all of the expression of that gene all at once. Now another type of RNA called microRNA can be produced from non-coding DNA and it's around 20 nucleotides in length. It's complementary to some sequences of mRNA and it actually matches up with that mRNA sequence creating double-stranded mRNA just here. And what this does is it stops translation from actually starting at all. Um, it's a cue, perhaps sometimes, for the cell to destroy that molecule. Maybe that protein is not needed anymore. Now, environmental changes can influence gene expression without changing the actual DNA sequence, and these are known as epigenetic changes. Now, these types of changes can be chemical, like the methylation and the acetylation on histones or DNA. They can be due to non-coding RNA sequences or post-translational modifications. So all those things we've run through already, that can be what is occurring in an epigenetic change. Now, these types of things are caused by things like chemical exposure, so smoking and organic pollutants, uh, can be caused by stress levels, your diet, and interestingly, they can be passed down onto future generations, so into new offspring. And this leads to some really interesting research across many generations of the same family. Now, since epigenetic changes do not affect the DNA sequence, right, the, the sequence of nucleotides, these changes are studied using identical twins. So they're going to have an identical genetic code. Identical twins should theoretically have identical physical characteristics if they have the same genes and the same DNA, and all of that DNA is dictating their physical characteristics. But since post-translational changes will always impact them, twins are used, uh, sorry, twins are used to uh, track epigenetic changes. So although the environment that twins may be brought up in is, is pretty similar, as they age, the number of changes to physical characteristics will also change. So we can see here with this, you know, the difference between three-year-old twins versus the difference between 50-year-old twins. And it, you know, these kinds of things can explain why one twin may be more predisposed to disease or respond differently when infected, things like that. And the longer that twins live apart, uh, the more epigenetic changes tend to accumulate. These are twin brothers who uh, work for NASA, and one of them went and lived in the International Space Station for a year, one stayed home, and then at the end of that, they are doing some quite substantial twin studies on them. It's really fascinating reading. Now, Genes that regulate long-term growth and development are also needed to be regulated. So these are those kind of big picture things. And changes that impact the morphology of an organism's body would need to be timed really specifically during embryonic development. At this stage, um, you know, it'd be really obvious differences in goals to say, you know, the changes in puberty. Right, And early scientists studied fruit flies, uh, fruit fly morphology, and later when an understanding of DNA sequences came more readily available, it was observed that even single nucleotide changes in a DNA sequence can lead to changes uh, in the morphology of an organism. Now, homeotic genes are those which control the structure and the organization of the body segments, so anatomical development. They're particularly active during embryonic development and help they help the, the growing organism to manage the timing and the spatial placing of specialized tissues and cells in their body. So we need to have particular nervous tissue, say, down our spine and into our brain, but also extending out into the other areas. Now, Hox genes, this is that, that homeo box, they're a type of homeotic gene, and their protein product, um, once expressed, is a transcription factor. And these proteins' presence in certain concentrations can indicate positional information, so to those developing cells. So where does the head go? Where does the posterior go? All those kinds of things. 
Now these genes are actually highly conserved during evolution. So across many different species, we see the same kinds of expression. If there's mutations in these gene sequences, it's also possible for incorrect development to occur, either at a you know, different time or a different place. For example, Drosophila, which are those fruit flies, there's around 13,000 genes within its genome. Only eight of them are responsible for determining the body structure, only eight. So these genes decide where the head, the abdomen, and the thorax are situated in the fly. And if there are mutations in the gene, it's possible for structures to grow in the wrong place. For example, legs where the antenna should be like this, or multiple uh, body segments where there are wings available. Now, cell differentiation also requires guidance from the overarching blueprint for the organism early on. Now, the biological sex of an organism will be determined in embryonic development as well, mainly through one single gene. And sex is determined by sex chromosomes within our diploid cells. In humans, we're talking X and Y chromosomes. That's what's filling these roles. Generally speaking, plenty of exceptions, though. Where there are two X chromosomes, this will produce physical characteristics of a female, and where there is an X and a Y combination, this will produce male characteristics. Again, there are so many exceptions, and we're going to speak about them more later in class. Now, on the Y chromosome, there is a tiny little gene called the SRY gene, the sex-determining region of the Y, and it codes for protein which binds to DNA to activate genes that develop gonads in the testes. So technically, it's a kind of transcription factor. Once the testes develop, they'll produce a hormone testosterone, right, in large quantities, which steers that embryonic development towards the male features like a penis and other reproductive structures. Now, female characteristics require two copies of the X chromosome to be properly directed to that formation of fully functioning ovaries. And the timing of this expression is also super important. If the SRY gene is expressed too late in the development, then the pathway for creating ovaries can also be already activated. Right, there's quite a lot there, really important to revise over what you do need to know and what's covered in these two lessons.